Today on Let the Bible Speak. Is there anything in a name? And if so, how were the churches in the New Testament referred to in Scripture? Our series about the church continues next on Let the Bible Speak. Greetings and welcome. I'm glad you're with us today. And if you're just finding us, I hope you'll take a few moments and look into the Bible with me. We're in a series about the church as we read about it in the New Testament. Before we get to today's topic, though, I think it's a good time to share with you a few things about the nature and objectives of this program, Let the Bible Speak. This is a weekly broadcast aimed at one thing, and that is teaching the Word of God. If you're watching over broadcast television, the local church has obtained this airtime to invite people in your community to investigate the Word of God with them. And if you're watching online, this YouTube channel and website is our out outreach here in my home church in Alabama in an effort to make the message of the Bible available to anyone who wants to watch and listen. And it's just as simple as that. Uh, Let the Bible Speak is not a television church, nor is it a religious body or organization. It's simply the name of this program, which local churches, including the one I'm a member of, choose to air in their respective parts of the country. You have never, nor will you ever, hear us solicit donations on our program, nor will you ever receive one piece of mail or one email asking you for a single penny. We are not here for your money, and we do not depend upon viewers to support the program. If you benefit from watching Let the Bible Speak, you can thank the members of a local church who are bringing it to you. And any and all glory goes to God above and His Son, whose word we strive to preach here in its purity and simplicity. Personally speaking, I count it a joy and a privilege to be afforded the opportunity to speak here from week to week. I'm no celebrity preacher, nor do I have any desire nor intention to be that. First, because I don't believe that's what God calls preachers to be, and second, I don't claim to have the makings of such. I'm simply a servant of Christ who has been graciously afforded the opportunity to preach the gospel of Christ. So we're glad you're here, and we hope you'll continue to watch from week to week, and I think you'll find us a bit different from much of what you see and hear today. As I mentioned, we're amid a series of lessons about the New Testament church, that wonderful body that Christ established 2,000 years ago, of which we today can still be part. If you've missed our series, all five studies so far are available on our YouTube channel, Let the Bible Speak TV, in the playlist, the New Testament Church series. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, last week we looked at the worship of the church. Today we want to consider its identity, or the name by which it was known. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Paul wrote, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named." The family of God wears some kind of name, according to the Apostle. What is that name? Or, I should ask, whose is that name? Names are very important to God. They always have been. And today we want to talk about names regarding the Lord's Church. Our lesson today, the identity of the New Testament Church, after a song from the congregation.
Most religious organizations wear a name. In fact, it's hard to find one that doesn't refer to itself in some unique way. I'm not referring to descriptions of the city or neighborhood or region telling people where a congregation meets, but rather names that identify them as belonging to a particular set of theological beliefs or practices or uh, maybe associating them with certain people who held those beliefs or people instrumental in their establishment. You know, not only is there an overwhelming number of denominations in the religious world today, but there are also just as many different names used to refer to various churches. It's ironic, though, that we often hear that there's nothing in a name and that names don't really matter, but yet every church seems to have one and usually spends a good deal of time choosing that name and using it to, you might say, brand their organization. You see, with many, names matter until you inquire about the scriptural reason for that name or you raise questions about the beliefs that that name represents and then all of a sudden they don't matter anymore. Well, what about the church in the New Testament? That is our standard. Did it wear a name? Now, due to the hostile culture and environment in which the early church often found itself, I doubt if most or even any of those churches went to the trouble of having a sign made to display pointing people to their meeting places wherever they may have been. Well, we don't know whether they did or they didn't, I doubt it. But that doesn't mean that they did not wear a divinely given name and that they were not known by that name, for they did. And they were. There were variations of that name, but they all referred to the same concept, the same people. Those names did not denominate and distinguish one group of believers from another as religious names do today. Rather, they were different ways of referring to the same person, the same truth, and the same group of people. We'll see more about that in just a few moments. The question now is, does it matter what we call the church or how we refer to it? Well, let me say this. If there's nothing in a name, religion is about the only sphere of life where we think that. People have names, and we usually value our name, and we're very protective of it. You would probably be insulted if I knowingly mispronounced or misrepresented your name. Uh, you might be offended if I called your wife or husband by someone else's last name than the one you both wear. Why? Well, because we don't think names are tri trivial. Uh, our name uniquely identifies us. It tells people something about us. It identifies us as belonging to a particular family. We descended from our parents and we wear that name. Or a woman marries a man and usually she takes his name as her own because they are now united as one. And then businesses have names. In fact, corporations spend millions of dollars adopting a name and promoting that name and associating their service or product with that name in people's minds. And they usually want a name that represents who they are and what they provide. Uh, that represents the integrity of the business. They want a name that reflects positively upon their business and they're highly protective of that name because of the damage that can result if it is abused or misused. And we could go on and on. There's no denying that names are important in every society around the world. But where did that come from? Why do we call people and things by names anyway? Would it surprise you to hear that the practice originated with God Himself? You know, when God created the world and filled it with life and then created the first man in His image, He gave that man a name. Genesis 2 and verse 19 is the first time the record refers to him as Adam, which means red ground or the man formed from the ground. You see, God gave him a name that described what he was and where he came from. God then said that it was not good for him to remain alone, and so he brought forth Eve, the first woman, and made her his wife. And so in Genesis 3, in verse 20, we read, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And from the dawning of time down to the centuries, God has placed a great deal of emphasis upon people's names. They are significant all throughout the Bible. This was the case in the generations following Adam and Eve. Several generations later, there was a man in Ur named Abram. And we remember that God called him out of Ur to the land of Canaan, choosing him as the one through whom God would continue to work out his redemptive plan for the world. And God made a covenant with him, 
saying in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. He then renamed Abraham's wife, Sarai, to become Sarah. Why would God do such if names are not significant to Him? From the union of Abraham and Sarah, God brought forth a family of people through whom He would operate in covenant relationship. And once again, we find God giving them a name. When God changed Abraham's grandson Jacob's name to Israel, He was assigning a name to His people. Now God didn't just arbitrarily attach some random name to Him and thus to His people, but rather gave them a name that was significant and meaningful. El in Hebrew means God. And thus God was exalting His own name by naming His people after Himself. He was identifying them as the people of God, a special people who were in covenant with Him by giving them such a name. Friend, God is jealous for His people, and He wanted them to be a people separated from all, uh, from all other so-called gods and the nations that serve those gods. And by the way, God's people today are to be a separate people as well. But one of the ways that God indicated that separation was by giving them a name that said as much. Daniel later said in Daniel 9 and verse 19, Thy people are called by thy name. Now, one may say, but that was Israel in the Old Testament. What does that have to do with the church today? Well, let's notice some of the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the church which Christ would later come and establish, the, the true Israel or God's covenant people today. Now, God plainly said to them back then that His people would one day be called by a new name. Now, read now in Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62 beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her righteousness goes forth and uh, as brightness, and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Well, this is prophesying of the age of Christ's kingdom. Notice that God's people in that day would receive a new name. And He says it would be an everlasting name that would never be cut off. And He says that name would be given when the Gentiles came to know God and His salvation. Well, turning now to the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. In Acts chapter 10, with the conversion of an Italian soldier named Cornelius, we see God confirming that salvation had been offered to the Gentiles or to people of any nation, not just the Jews. And in the chapter before that, chapter 9, we read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and how Christ was going to rename him as Paul and use him as an apostle. Notice in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15 how he told Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And then two chapters later, we find Paul in the city of Antioch with Jews and Gentiles teaching the Word of God. And the Scripture says there in Acts chapter 11 verse 26, And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now some say that was a name given to them by unbelievers in derision and ridicule. I don't believe that for a second. It is much more than coincidence that as the other requirements of Isaiah's prophecy were being fulfilled, the record says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Friend, this was a divinely given name. It was later used twice in Scripture by Paul and Peter to refer to those who were in Christ. The name Christian simply means a Christ follower. Notice how that name indicates who we follow. Christ. In other words, bearing the name Christian, they were and we are bearing the name of Christ Himself and identifying ourselves as being His followers. Now friend, Christians then and now are to be known as belonging to and following Jesus today and not, and not man. In fact, Paul was alarmed at the divisions that were springing up in the Corinthian church, and he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, 
Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? That even has a modern ring to it, doesn't it? When you consider the many denominations and divided religious organizations that have since come about and the names that some of them wear. You know, friend, if I were going to wear a name besides Christ, Paul would be a good one, wouldn't it? You'll never find a truer and more devoted servant of Christ than the Apostle Paul. But yet here Paul strictly forbade people from wearing his name. If Paul forbade people wearing the names of the apostles, I can't imagine him being complicit with people today wearing the names of men who amount to much less. No, Paul said that we are to be of Christ. We have been baptized into the name of Christ. We have been baptized into a saving relationship with Christ. We are to, from that point forward, be the disciple of Christ. My question is, why would we desire to wear any name besides Christ? Let's think now about the relationship between Christ and the church. How is the church described? What well, it is the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, Ephesians 4, and verse 12. It is the bride of Christ. When Paul described the relationship of a husband to his wife in Ephesians chapter 5, he then explained in verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Today we usually expect a new bride to begin wearing the name of her husband because this indicates the relationship between them. Two who were separate have now become as one. Well, if the church is the bride of Christ and married spiritually to Him, why should it not be identified as such? Why should it wear some other name? Again, the church is called the family or household of God in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, over which Christ is the head. Ephesians 5 verse 23 says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Well, shouldn't the family of which Christ is head wear his name? You see, Christ is the builder of the church, not Martin Luther, not John Wesley, not John Knox, not John Calvin, or any other man. Why should we wear the name or identify ourselves as being followers of any person besides Christ? The church has been put on earth to bring glory to God. So why should it wear a name that brings glory to someone else or to itself? The church has been given many things to believe and practice within the faith once delivered unto it, Jude verse 3. But why should we be identified by one of those particular features or practices? For example, the church of the New Testament certainly practiced baptism and placed great significance upon it, Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21. But that doesn't mean the church should be called by that practice. The early church was very careful to follow the right methods, but is that what the name should indicate? The church of the New Testament had elders or presbyters, but is that how the church should be identified and referred to in name? The church that Jesus built is universal in its scope, but does that constitute the name it should wear, the universal church? You see, why one feature, practice, or doctrine over another? Friend, listen now. The reason some may attach those kinds of names to the church is to delineate them from others that believe or practice something else. And so those names, by their very nature, divide. Those doctrines are important, and what the Bible teaches about them is important. But delineating the church by such names divides. The name of Jesus Christ unites. The church is identified in several variations in the New Testament, but what I want us to see is they are all rooted in a common name. They are descriptions of the same thing, the same people. Notice some of them and what they have in common. In Romans 16 and verse 16, the churches of Christ greet you, said Paul. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Well, who is the firstborn? Revelation 1 and verse 5 says, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The church of the firstborn, you see, is the church of Christ, God's Son, who shed His blood for the church. 
The church is the bride of Christ. It is the body of Christ. And then at least eight times it is called the church of God. But what or who does that refer to? Well, look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 now. Paul there said to the Ephesian elders, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. Notice it now. The church of God, which He, who? God, shed with His, whose? God's own blood. Well, who does God therefore refer to? God in this case refers to Christ, the Son, you see. Yes, my friend, God has given the church of His Son a name. It is a divine name. It is the name above all names. It is the name of Christ Himself who purchased and built and who is sovereign over His church. Now I know and I fully agree that wearing the name of Christ within itself does not make a church the church of Christ. But the question is, why would a church that does belong to Christ choose to wear some other name? Think about that, my friend, and I'll return with more in a moment. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. I hope you're enjoying and benefiting from our series on the New Testament church. If you'd like a free printed copy or transcript of today's sermon, we'll be glad to send it to you. The lesson is The Identity of the New Testament Church, requested by that title, The Identity of the New Testament Church, and your free copy will be on its way. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program today, not only does it not cost, we will never beg or solicit from you one single dime. We are not here for your money. These materials are free to you, and we hope that you'll take them and use them and study them and distribute them. 
Uh, we are glad that you're with us on the program and hope you'll join us from week to week. And you can also find us anytime online. Our YouTube channel is Let the Bible Speak TV. And when you visit that, would you please click that subscribe button and share the content. And that will help us in the, in the spread of the gospel of the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you've been with us today. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead and make your plans to join me back here for another Bible study when we'll continue our series on the New Testament church. Until then, God bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.